You guys are so welcoming. Um, so my name is Robert Pierce. Um, I've been a dev professionally for a little over six years, and I'm from South Carolina in the United States. So you may have heard a few y'alls this morning. You're going to hear a lot, a lot more of that. That's just that's how I do. Okay, so before I get started, a couple things. One, I got engaged like last week, so woo! <laughs> two, two, a Kiwi. So I'm going to be spending a lot more time in New Zealand. I look forward to spending more time in y'all's community. Oh, there we go. See? <laughs> um, number two is if you recognize this color scheme, that is because after getting engaged, I went on New Zealand's immigration website, and I thought, wow, these, these folks really know what they're doing. This is really good design. It's really user-friendly, and I love the color scheme. So props if any of you worked on that, but I ripped the color scheme. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about behavior in your team. Originally, this talk was going to be about you know, teamwork for A players. And I gave a talk last week to the Mental Health in Tech Auckland group. And you know, what, what discussions happened after were just so powerful that I decided to change my talk entirely and you know, tell some of those stories and tell some other stories. And that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, there's going to be a bit of storytelling. Um, it's going to be serious topics that I keep as light as possible because I haven't, you know, very, I'm not a uh, health professional. I'm not, you know, a therapist or anything like that. I am just a guy who's been, you know, on teams and experienced and seen some things. So we're going to be telling some stories. Story number one, code horror. I'm, not, I'm trying not to use real names. So we're going to go with my friend Jennifer was using sc uh, Screen Hero to pair with a coworker of hers. You know, everything was fine, you know, coding along, and all of a sudden they encounter a bug, and they wonder, what can we, you know, what can we do about this bug? Okay, let's go look, at, let's go look where it's coming from. We're going to go find the function. We're going to do, you know, look at the call stack, whatever. And... The person that's driving, her coworker, we'll call him Brian, goes into GitHub, pulls up the repository, looks at the code, and his reaction is, holy crap, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. I can't believe somebody wrote this. This is terrible. Horrible. Well, you know, normally when, you know, th there might be a culture where it's like, oh man, there's this horrible code. Let's complain about it. And now we're together in our pain and now we'll solve the problem. But when you're Jennifer and you actually wrote that code, like how, does that, how do you think that makes her feel? Probably not very good. So how do you react to this when you first look at it? You're like, damn, that's some callback hell right there. But, you know, that's a dangerous response when you're working with people that maybe wrote that code and wrote that for a reason. Now, whether we agree with that reason or not, sure. So there's, a, there's some articles that I've seen recently um, that were written recently or written a little while ago. Um, stuff like, things programmers should never say. Who wrote this awful code? That scenario I just walked through, that, you know, that is crushing to someone. You know, we heard this morning in the, uh, in the keynote um, about, about this exact topic. Another example, a little more humorous, but very serious. How to use a code review to execute someone's soul. Now, obviously, this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and someone is trying to make a point that you actually can do that. But it's, it's all fun and games until it really hits home. So this, this is Heather Arthur, who created a library open sourced it, and then a few folks on Twitter decided to openly crucify that. So I'm going to read this for those of you who can't see that or just to drive in some impact. I cannot even make this stuff up. Ever wanted to make said or crep worse? Or just point to the actual code file. I is bleeding. Let, let that sink in. If, if you wrote that code, how would that make you feel? Not good, right? It's pretty dark. I, I do want to point out that every single one of these people publicly apologized later. But, you know, by then the damage was done. 
However, this is a learning experience too for us. So I like to look at code now uh, when I come across stuff like this. Not in a, oh my gosh, I've got to debug this. Or, oh man, like, you know, some rookie wrote this. No, 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 no. I look at it in the same way that I now view highways or interstates, whatever you guys call them here in New Zealand. Interstates, like, like the one where I come from, there's an interstate called I-26. It runs the length of my state from the northwest to the southeast, and it's not the most attractive thing in the world. It's lined by trees, and it's just gravel. Well, not gravel, it's asphalt and some gravel here and there. But it's, it's just a road, and that's it. And now people com I hear people complain about that all the time, and I'm sure it's the same thing here, like, man, what a boring drive. Um, but what we kind of have to remember is that highways are not art. They serve a function. Back in the, I think it was the 50s when uh, President Eisenhower authorized the ability to have massive construction across the states, um, you know, this money was being put primarily towards highway, the highway system and the ability to expand travel and expand commerce and allow people to come together. If, you're, if your family member lived three states away, you wanted to go and see that person. You know, without a highway system, it would be you know, kind of a difficult journey. So the people that came and built these highway systems, they were, you know, they were, they were breaking ground, new ground. Places that hadn't been, you know, they were clearing forests, laying asphalt, drawing these lines in a perfectly straight line along the road and making the bends just right to protect people. And when they were done, they said, this is awesome. This is, has enabled so much. And no, it's not a piece of art. It's not something you're going to put up in a museum and say, hmm. But it was something that provided function, and it worked, and it enabled so much more to come after it and happen. And of course, improvements were made to roads. And the same, this, all of this ports directly over to code and to repositories and teamwork and work. Because when someone goes and writes a function or writes some new feature, they're not writing bad code on purpose. No one does a bad job on purpose. And so every time I come and I see code like this, it's not the PC police that are like, you know, in my head, like, oh, I can't talk bad about this. It's instead, uh, call, call it empathy. Call it, yeah, I get where you're coming from. Um, because these are people that had a problem and they solved it in the best way that they knew how at the time. Maybe they were juniors. Maybe they were pressed for time. You know, maybe they were, ins insert thing here. But I try to understand the why. The how, maybe that's subjective opinion. But that's that. Got an another little story here for you. It's about passive aggression. I'm going to keep this very top level. It's going to be a very simple story. Um, it's about my friend Nick. And Nick hardcore developer, can do everything under the sun. And Nick would get, you know, he's a part of a pipeline. You've got design, you've got the development, you've got shipping it out, you've got ops, whatever. And he is part of that development pipeline. And he was receiving um, SVGs and other design work in a way that wasn't, you know, good for his workflow or any, anyone else on the team's workflow. So specifically, like with SVG, you know, just exporting a whole bunch of stuff that looks good maybe in Illustrator, maybe it looks good in Sketch, but it wasn't, you know, grouped together, it wasn't symbols, it was just, it was crazy. You know, it took him an extra two hours a day just to sort through all of this design work. So his answer was, you know, so-and-so is not going to get the job done, so I'm, I'll just do it. I'll be the one to do it. So it takes the extra time per day, does all this extra work, new design comes down, repeat. New design work comes down, repeat. And this person thinks that they're, you know, they're solving the problem, they're just like, ah, I'll just do it. But over time, that person is slowing down you know, and not being able to pull their own weight, potentially, 
um, the original problem isn't getting solved. And you know, how do you think the relationship is between Nick and you know, the designer that was putting that stuff uh, you know, up for a deliverable? How do you think that relationship was? And how do you think Nick talks about that person, interacts with them? Probably not that good. So real quick, I want to ask a few questions. Do you always go the extra mile? Do you resent coworkers who leave right at 5 p.m.? Do you nitpick syntax? How does this affect our relationships with those around us? All those little, you know, seemingly, oh, like so-and-so, he, he doesn't even care about this project. You know, she's always leaving at five. Like, I'm here busting my, you know, my, busting my butt, trying not to say bad words. Um, busting my butt, trying to get this stuff done, and so-and-so, you know, they're here 8.30 to five, out. What's up with that? I think you can answer this yourself. So next I want to talk about a culture of criticism. And this word, this phrase was dropped last week in the mental health and tech group in Auckland. And I thought it was, I thought it was on point. So today, well not today, right now I want to tell a story about my friend Ryan. And Ryan started a new job, you know, went through the whole onboarding process, got set up with the systems, you know, set up with HR, etc. And after that, he got paired uh, with another coworker. And this coworker, the first thing they did was go and pull up all of the legacy code that they have at their company, and they talked crap about it. That was the expectation: was you have someone new, you lay out all the bad things right there. And Ryan expressed to me like, "Hey, this is really kind of like weird." I don't really know how to react. It's my first day. Am I supposed to be negative about this stuff? Like someone really worked hard on this, and maybe it's, you know, not maybe it's a bunch of spaghetti code, as mentioned earlier. But like, what am I supposed to do here? I feel weird. Like I feel like I'm not going to fit in until I criticize. So here's an example of that. What if I told you we wrote 50,000 lines of backbone? Backbone.js, I don't know how many of you have worked with it, but 50,000 lines of anything isn't chunk change, especially if you know, that's one of the technologies that is just not as popular nowadays. When you come in and you hear this, like, are you how are you supposed to react? What are you supposed to do? You know, when, people, you know, when people say, oh, this is a big pile of crap, and this is our production system, and it's horrible, it's terrible, but it works. Um, but like, what are you supposed to do about that? You probably look like this. Because <laughs> that's, that's, that's my reaction, is like, I'm not sure what to do here. <laughs> and you're fresh, and so, that's, that phrase is something that I'm definitely gonna be taking into the future. I can't remember who said it last week, it wasn't me, um, but, that phrase is something I'm gonna take into the future. And constructive criticism is one thing, but trying to join everyone in negativity is probably not something that works too well. All right, quick story about Hero Complex. I can't keep, keep, I can't keep making up names. So, person A <laughs> is, working on, is working on a project and <laughs> You know, this is your, your A player, your go-getter, your, I want to prove myself. I want to work as hard as I can. I want to take the big problems and solve it and write all the problems in, in the world. And the world at that time is this company. I want to, so, you know, person A is given a task. Go fix this bug. We've got this bug in the uploading and something's not right. Just need you to fix it. Really, you know, should be a straightforward task person gets in there, they experience that code horror that we were talking about earlier, and they said, you know what? I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to make this little thing a little bit better. Okay, well, you make that one thing better, and then you, you know, do the inverted Russian doll, where you're like, oh, but this thing's wrapping it. I could do something similar and really turn this thing around and show others that, like, hey, I got this. 
I'm, I'm strong at, at my work. I'm strong at my job, at my role. I can bring value. <laughs> so then you do that all the way up. So what, what began as one job fixing this uploading feature became, let's rewrite all of this stuff. Let's make it all use one flow and make everything unified. Well, two weeks later, <laughs> you know, what's happened? I've got a name for this. It's called rabbit hole refactoring. I don't know if anyone else has used that, but I really like it. Um, Alice in Wonderland is a you know, good, good old story. And whenever I think about myself or anyone else going into that hole, I think of you know, Alice or something going down into the rabbit hole and just getting caught in this whole crazy world where all of a sudden you come, you know, you come up for air two weeks later and you're like, man, what have I really done? Not sure if refactoring the code uh, made, made the code more understandable or I just understand the code better because I spent hours on it. That's how I feel about it. And it's taken me years to get to that point. And, man, so, and also, if it's one of these systems that's, that people have been criticizing, and you have just come and refactored and put this brand new thing in there, in something that's already falling down, that's like putting a shiny new toilet into this place. And really, eventually, it's going to get demolished anyway. So maybe just solve the problem, or make notes of it, or write tests and add type annotations, whatever. But try to remain focused. I thought this was a great, great quote from Shubham Jain. I don't know if I can pronounce that. But when you get hired, you're not chosen to be a one-off star to fix everything bad. You're chosen to be part of a team. So unsurprisingly, I had trouble making up all of these names because I was that person and the antagonist in all of these and much worse. The person wanting to prove themselves, the person wanting to work the long hours, the person you know, so bound to ideology and opinion that you become, or I became, uh, inflexible. You know, not nitpicking, oh my god, there's an extra space here, or you put the semicolon on the wrong line, or you know, like this thing has a complexity of big O this instead of, and you can imagine that didn't have a very good effect on the people I worked with. All of a sudden people are trying to slide, slide PRs around me. People don't want to work with me. It sucks. As soon, as soon as you realize this. So I've got another story I want to tell. This is not mine at all. A friend of mine had a problem two weeks ago, and this is something in the workplace. In his workplace, it was a new workplace. He was brand spanking new at this place. And it really bothered me. It really made me kind of upset. And um, my, my Kiwi fiance is, is a behavioral therapist, you know, by trade. She's got a master's degree, all that stuff. And, you know, she made some recommendations to him that I wanted to share with you all. So my friend, James, uh, of course not a real name, but my friend James came into a workplace that was emotionally insane. A couple of, couple of things here. You have team leaders completely undermining, you know, talk, saying horrible things about them and their families, uh, about other teams. Um, you've got their idea of a like, team building project was after hours, provide alcohol, bring in a server that had crashed that week, and have everyone bash it with a baseball bat. Like, like that scene from Office Space. But in that scene in Office Space, it was kind of funny. Like in real life, it's really awkward. And <laughs> all that happened was that the really hyper-aggressive people that, that were in that workplace were just given a baseball bat and were told to hit something. And that, you know, people, he said people left, um, you know, it started getting a little out of hand, people were drinking too much, and, you know, it's like, it's a funny thing, except that you, you start to realize, man, these people might not be the people I thought they were. They might be, or they might not be acting that way. Their behavior is not, 
is not something that, that you might want to partake in. So another aspect to that is that one of these people in the company, um, emotionally abuse is a strong word, but comes down on him. And he's been there maybe two weeks. And there's someone that constantly comes down on him and belittles him and you know, makes him feel terrible all the time. He goes to HR, is told, ah, don't take that person seriously. That's just how they are. Like, that's not really helpful, <laughs> right? And so he asked me, Robert, well, Robert, what can I do to, to remedy this, to, uh, to amend this? And I was like, man, I don't know. So I asked my fiance, and she told me about something that uh, she works with known as extinction, where you cease the reinforcement of certain behavior. In this case, opinionated and subjective, horrible behavior that I happen to agree with in that case. And everything from when people are doing these things to you or saying horrible things about these other teams, you know, they're looking for well, reinforcement's the word, but they're looking for you to acknowledge that and get on board with them and like reinforce that, hey, that statement you said right there with you. Instead, what you can do is say, maybe I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'm, I just won't respond to them. I'll leave the room. I'm not gonna let them get a rise or a high or acknowledgement um, from this type of behavior. So, there's a problem with this, is that when you start doing this, when you start not giving any credence, if that's, if that's the right word, to that behavior, <laughs> this starts happening. It's called an extinction burst. It begins right after, it begins, well, in theory, um, right after you begin not reinforcing that behavior. They're gonna come at you hard. They're gonna try, to throw things at you and try to get a rise out of you, try to get you to respond, acknowledge, reinforce. Now, while this is funny, this would be terrifying in real life. <laughs> when an employee demoralizes the entire team or when a bully causes future stars to quit the organization, too often we shrug and point out that this person has tenure or vocational skills or isn't so bad or to go back to what the HR person told James. That's just, that's just how he is, you know. Don't think twice about it. The, to, this, to this day, there's still no solution. However, this extinction event is something that he, or extinction is something he is still trying. You know, but last I spoke with him, he said that while I could quit or take this to a higher level and get this person fired, which is what I would do, but he t he's looking at it in another way. He's looking at it as, I'm on this team, and I'm not, you know, I'm not some moral authority. I'm not the person you know, that, that can be judging others. And while this might be affecting other people, I don't know if it is. So I'm going to look at it as an opportunity for me to learn. I'm gonna look at it as an opportunity for me to take on this challenge. Like, how, can I force myself to deal with this and not, you know, let it grow. A couple different ways of dealing with that. There are greener pastures out there for folks like Jason. And, now, and like I said, quit, get that person fired, have the behavior change. But whatever, whatever your greener pasture is, like visualize that and go to it. So last thing I want to talk about is uh, self-reflection. So, who here watches NASCAR? A lot of folks, yeah? Me, oh, nice. Yeah, me neither. But uh, <laughs> um, I don't know enough about it. And there's a, there's a great movie, potentially you know, offensive, uh, with Will Ferrell called Talladega Nights. Incredibly, incredibly entertaining, but it, it brought NASCAR to the forefront of of you know, people's minds at the time. And at that time, I thought, man, I never thought about how those people, you know, in seconds, can do an entire servicing to a vehicle. 
how they can do an entire servicing to a vehicle and you know, change, the, change the tires, you know, fill up the gas, get the oil in there, mess with any engine stuff, the brakes, whatever. How they can do that so quickly and get that car back doing what it's supposed to be doing, driving, going fast. So I looked it up. And each single person you see on that, I guess, whatever, tarmac or race course, it, every single person you see there has one job. And they need to execute that job flawlessly. And they all need to work together as one unit, as a team. And individually, they compose their team to accomplish a goal. So, like our role in a company in one sense, if you're working on a team, is you have a role. You were selected to do X. You were, you know, you're told to do the design, you're told to do the front end, back end, whatever. Whatever your role is, you have a role that you can do. But that's not everything. Because the team is what must succeed, not just necessarily you individually. So when you're on a team, yeah, you've got your job to do. You've got your productivity, your tickets to close, your PRs to merge. But to actually make you know, that engine purr, to make the team succeed, there's a few other things. Lifting up everyone. You know, being there when someone needs you. and being a general help, a teammate. Seriously, I could watch that all day. <laughs> so this is an echo of what was just here on the panel before. But I want you, and I'll, ask my, I'll do this for myself, but I want you to ask yourselves, who do you want to be? You're at work, how many hours? 40, 50, 60 hours a week. It's a lot of your week. That's your life. That's you. You're not a different person at work. That's you. So who do you want to be? What effect do you want to have on other people? As I said earlier, is this about being PC and walking on eggshells? No, it's not that at all. Instead, it's about being cognizant of the consequences of your actions, whether positive or negative, being aware that if I act like this, it's going to have this outcome. As long as, as, long as we, all, we can all think about that and not judge ourselves, because you know, every, single, every single day you might be 20 different people. You know, you're the person that's just woken up. You know, you're the tired person. You're the stressed person. You're the elated person that you just got engaged, whatever. So, your story, what will it be? <laughs> My subjective opinion is that the only way forward is together. If you can do, if you can do life, do work by yourself, yeah, right. it's okay, let it out. <laughs> Didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> um, but really, the only way forward, I think, is together. And so, as long as we can think about others, and be there for others, and be something for others, I think we'll be all right. Thanks. <laughs>